Oh, 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 we're live. Okay. <laughs> hey, everyone. All right. Are we good to go? Ah. Well, we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, this is the uh, mobile versus desktop panel. And first of all, it's an honor for all of us to be here and an honor for all of you to be here among. Isn't it amazing? We're all here in London doing what we love, a bunch of audio people working in the <laughs> development sphere. It's, it's freaking awesome. Give yourself a round of applause. Yeah. Seriously, Woo. this is great. Woo. And it's just an honor for me to be here among this great panel. I've been watching this online for five years, and I'm finally here in London. So I'll just go around and let them introduce themselves, starting with Henrik. Oh, wow. Uh, hey, <laughs> hello, I'm Henrik. I'm from Sweden, and I uh, run a company called Auxis, just two people, and we build powerful music app for iOS devices, mainly iPhones. Before that, I was an early member of the SoundCloud team, and before that, I was had a short stint at Propellerhead in Stockholm. Boom. Is that enough? Right? Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Matt Derbyshire. Uh, for the last 14 years, I've been with Focusrite, Novation, and Amplify. Um, Today, I'm here as an independent because I've recently left to become a full-time dad. Um, that's going to keep me busy. And for the past, I guess, 14 years, I guess Focusrite has grown massively from maybe a 20-person company to now something like 400, from about a million to something like a third of a billion on the stock market. Uh, it's crazy to use those terms. But most importantly, uh, I think what's been amazing to be part of for that time is making really fun products like Focusrite Scarlet, um, Base Station, and Launch Pads, and yes. the apps. Um, so yeah, I feel very lucky to be part of that journey and excited on my next steps and happy to be here with these fantastic people. <laughs> uh, my name is Henny the Business. I am a Grammy Award winning record producer, songwriter. I'm also a YouTuber and a professor at Morehouse College. I've uh, been in the music industry 20 years worked with the likes of everybody from Kendrick Lamar, Drake, Lil Wayne, T-Pain, Chris Brown, Randy, Monica, Jay-Z, the list goes on for some years. And uh, I've been very blessed to uh, be amongst all of you, uh, audio developers and the like. And uh, you know, I'm a fully iOS record producer in 2019, so I do all of my music on the iOS platform. So, boom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Gaz Williams. I do a lot of kind of synth and technology reviews for sonicstate.com. I'm also a professional uh, bass player and I play MIDI bass. I play with uh, Underworld and um, God, loads of people. I play in the Charlotte Church, Late Night Pop Dungeon as well, and various other things. Uh, <laughs> and I am always, always, always looking for new ideas but especially ideas which tap into expressivity and that human emotion, you know, that's, so I'm always looking for things which are, you know, emotion to music, things that kind of enable that process. Excellent. And to get started, we actually have questions from people who wish they were here but couldn't make it, various music tech people from around the world, and they have questions for this esteemed panel. Mm -hmm. So we'll get right into it with our first guest, uh, I guess, speaker, which is Bo Beats, the synthesis YouTuber. And here he is. Let's say hi to everybody. Bo <laughs> here from Bo Beats. And I have a question for the esteemed panel, and I've written it down here on my, on my iPad. So what I'm wondering is if the panel thinks that a small computer with a touch screen has any real chance at replacing the mouse and keyboard in a studio. And I guess that if you think it does, why? Why would it replace mouse and keyboard and a traditional computer? What would the real benefit be when it comes to recording, mixing, moving clips of audio around, clips of MIDI around? creating MIDI notes, where would the touch screen actually excel or be better for an end user than a mouse and keyboard? So I guess I'm asking if you think professionals are willing to trade their laptops, big external screens, mouse and keyboards for these touch devices, and if so, why? All right, who wants to take it? Uh, as the record producer on the panel, um, 
I, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think, you know, my journey into learning how to continuously get creative ideas out, regardless of the platform that I was using it on, um, has always been one of trying to, you know, drop creativity, right? We're always trying to figure out what thing is going to get us to that you know, to that to creation as fast as possible. And what I've come to realize over the last five years using iOS products is just you have specific apps that are built to do really great things and you can get your ideas out quickly, efficiently, and on to collaborating. Because one of the biggest things that I believe the iOS platform is greatest for is collaboration. Uh, when you have things, you know, where everybody can use different, you know, different devices and be able to use products like Ableton Link or just AirDrop and other ways that you can get your uh, ideas out quickly, I don't think you have to worry so much about will it replace something, but will it help you get your idea going? So that's, yeah. Anybody else? Anyone else? I think it's an interesting question in as much as, like, something that's very developed like Cubase, and Cubase has just reached 10.5 uh, and is a very, very sophisticated piece of software that allows you to do like the whole production. So for something on a mobile platform to have that same depth is kind of unlikely and probably not what you want in the... You know, in a touch. You yeah. want the fast instant. Yeah whether you can actually take that mobile project to the end mix level. So you would never take that, you don't put that through, you don't take stems out into another piece of software. You will do the, you'll make your final mix in, in the iOS? Both, I've been able to do you know, full on mixes on mm -hmm. iOS to sell tracks, mm -hmm. but also uh, collaborate, take the stems mm -hmm. and airdrop them to Pro Tools. Okay. But I mean, like, you know, things like Isotope Ozone for like mastering, you know, we, we need to see these power tools be imported across into the mobile platform in order to be able to work at that at the professional level, you know. And I still think we're not quite there yet. But AUV3 has been a, a good step, I think. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. It, uh, I think the question was would a touchscreen replace a desktop? Um, I think it's useful alongside it. It mm. doesn't need to replace it. And I think that's yeah. what you were hinting at, which right. is maybe the benefits of touch are that different perspective of forming ideas mm -hmm. in, without With the precision. Right. You don't need precision when you're generating ideas, but then certainly when you move into a more detailed space, a mouse is kind of quite useful or a, or a trackpad or a, or a desktop. So I think they complement each other. They don't replace each other. Henry, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. We'll, we'll I, I could, I could. <laughs> I think you're, you're right on to the right thing. I think it's somehow like whenever this discussion comes up, this is kind of what it leads into. It's like, can we adopt the desktop paradigm in sort of iPads with all the features, all the plugins, all the ways of thinking, all the ways of working? And I think that's, like you're saying, that's the wrong way to look at it in a way. Um, I think what's good about touch interfaces is that they can to a level sort of abstract the device and sort of bring, bring force and focus the experience. But on the other hand, sort of a, a mouse and keyboard setup is much better in terms of high density type work. Um, so, so these are two different things. And it's a kind of, I probably come back to this, but what I'm interested in is also like separating this notion of like iPads or laptops, because what I think is interesting is what is mobile and what people have in their pockets. And I assume like not many people have an iPad in their pockets, but I know all of you at least have their iPhones in their pockets and probably 99% of you too. Um, so, and that's where I think that the sort of interesting divide is, uh, more or less. Excellent, we can get into more of that later. The next question is for more of the developer side. Uh, this person asking is in the desktop and the iOS world. They make official sounds for Ableton. They do official packs for native instruments as well. And they got into the iOS game and released two apps. And the reason they went to iOS to desktop is a question they want to ask now. What's going on, everybody? My name is M. Simp, founder, owner of MSX Sound Design. Thank you guys for having us. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to be a part of you know, this wonderful event. Um, my question today is, 
to the other developers, the panelists, what are your thoughts around protecting of assets within the iOS arena? Um, for instance, you know, when we launched our two apps, Low Fly Dirt, Fly Tape into the App Store, one of the more attractive things about the App Store was the protection aspect of what Apple provides. So I felt like it was a bit more robust than what we would found on the VST side, um, venturing out into that arena. So we chose to ultimately go with iOS plugins. Um, or we didn't have to worry too much about piracy and torrenting and things like that. So I'm always curious to know what other guys' thoughts are. Um, if you guys could share some feedback or some different thoughts that you guys have around that, I'd certainly appreciate it. But, you know, feel free to contact us after the fact. We'd love to have a conversation with you guys. But, again, thank you for having us. Um, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to ask this question. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> so, you know, he's basically saying, like, they, they were, you know, postponing VSTs because they're worried about it's not a closed system like iOS. And, you know, how do you feel about piracy and things like that? And is, is that one way where iOS shines or is that even still an issue now? Piracy has never been an issue on iOS, no. <laughs> there are other issues, but not piracy. Oh, well, I think he's asking is, um, or is, like, is that why we're on iOS or not? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I know that companies who are not on iOS, who are on Windows and uh, Mac OS, they obviously have a big problem with piracy. But I don't know if we can speak more to that. Uh, that's not the reason, really, why I am there. OK. And I know people like Chris Randall at front, he's got rid of all his copy protection. <laughs> I like his style, I like his style. <laughs> Your sales actually went up when you got rid of prior, or copy protection, right? What? Our you, sales yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> excellent, okay. Well, uh, we'll just move on to the next question. Um, because I feel like a lot of you guys all have your own um, thoughts on that and maybe you could get in touch with MSIM directly. The next one is from Nick Batts from Sonic State. <laughs> if, if only someone from Sonic State was here now. Hello there, hope you're having a good conference. Uh, I have a question. I'm curious to know what you think needs to happen to kind of migrate even more professionals who are used to their own desktop workflows or laptop workflows with all of the extra processing and screen real estate uh, that that entails. What needs to happen to persuade them to uh, move more into the mobile market and use their tablets and their phones for their more professional um, usages? Thanks. Great question. Um, I'll start and say that I know that um, I've seen everything. My first keyboard was an ASR 10 in like 1996, 1997. And I remember the days where it started to go from analog to digital, and now we're in the days it's from digital to mobile, right? So there are these big gaps of like, how do I even go about doing that? And I believe, you know, uh, it inevitably comes down to people being successful doing it. Because anytime you see somebody doing some shit that's like, oh, they did that on that, how did they do that? So I know there was a guy back, um, you know, in early 2000s, he's a hip hop producer by the name of Ninth Wonder. Um, and in the hip hop community, you know, we didn't know too much about using laptops, just a laptop to create beats on. And he was using a program called Fruity Loops. He did it, he started to work with an artist named Jay-Z. He worked on his album called The Black Album. And everybody were like, how, how the fuck did he do that? What, how, what was going on? And then the success of that made everybody say, you know what, I need to try that. And as people try it, then more developers, and people say, wow, a lot of people are trying this. A lot of people are trying the things. and and." For me, that's one of the reasons I wanted to jump on this iOS bandwagon is to be able to say how possible is it professionally? Because now, you know, like tomorrow, right, we have the Grammy nominees coming out uh, for 2020. And uh, one of the records that I created for a guy named Jay Cole is being uh, possibly nominated tomorrow for, uh, you know, another Grammy. And it was done on iOS. And to be able to tell that story is another reason to be able to tell people that it's possible to create successful music on the platform. And then you do that and you show people what you're using and then the, you know, the applications become more robust and smarter. That's my idea. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I, I like this. And um, 
for me, it's like fascinating to having been sort of, I'm old enough to having lived through, you know, all this, like, oh, no, you can never make real music in a home studio. Oh, no, you can <laughs> yeah, ne right. never make like with this right. keyboard. Like, yeah. You know, you need all this and that. And then eventually, you know, it, it's common knowledge now that people like Avicii or someone like that would, you know, you've seen these documentaries go around with a laptop under a blanket <laughs> in a hotel or something. It's like, uh, and now I've been telling people for 10 years, like, you know, people will make great music on mobiles. It's, it's going to happen. And, and everyone has been like, oh, no, you can never make real music on a phone. It's like, uh, and now that's happening. What, what I don't, what I think we see slightly different, though, is I, I don't really see this, like, why it's, because to me, like, the, the, the iPad is just sort of a touch extension of, of the laptop. And I see like, sort of iPads and, and, and um, MacBooks sort of growing together more than, and, and the, the sort of the, the big difference becomes then if you go all the way out to an iPhone, which is a completely different uh, device, a completely different sort of distribution, uh, and a way of thinking of things. And, and that's obviously where I'm invested and care about sort of changing things. So I don't know if, if you have any other thoughts on that. Well, there's also, I think, um, Nick's question was, what does it mean to take um, advanced <laughs> musicians? Great, we did the politician thing. We just answered. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, so, and so I think what he's saying is, and having worn a novation hat for many years, I think from a, from a synthesizer enthusiast's perspective, um, there's less to excite you because there aren't any knobs. And, and they're important to synthesizer people. So I think basically what Nick might want is just more knobs and sliders on a touch screen. <laughs> <laughs> and it, point maybe, taken, point maybe taken. Maybe we can wrap it around with a hardware extension around it. But, um, but they, are, they are different things. And I, think, I don't think you should make people use something. You should encourage them towards it. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like what Auxi has done in particular, which is to encourage those people who, who would be intimidated by synthesizers to use Auxi and have a great time. Um, and if you want to keep using synthesizers for those knobs and existing set, just stay there, have yeah. a great time. You, and, you, and you I mean, enjoy it a lot. But, but to also answer that question, it's like, I've seen this interview with Majid Jordan, who's like producers and artists, and they're on stage and they're like getting interviewed and they're pretty bored. And they get this question, so how do you make music? It's like, yeah, we use Ableton. And oh, and yeah, we have this app now that we just found. And they talk about Oxy, which just happened to be my app. But uh, what he says is basically like, yeah, just love. I can just hang out in my sofa and, you know, smoke and make some beats. Why do I have to sit in the studio and feel like I'm doing that's Excel good. work all the time? Right. Like, yeah. And that's also like shifting the, you don't have to replace the studio, but you can find new ways of, of being creative and, and, you know, sparking that idea that becomes yeah. the essence of the track eventually. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just wonder as well, though, just uh, coming to the thing about uh, professional software on the desktop, whether mm, it should have... Uh, an, uh, like an iOS or a mobile version. Like Cubase has done it with Cubasis and you can download a little importer for Cubase. So a project that you create on Cubase, on Cubasis, you can then import into Cubase. But you can't then do it the other way then. You can't then just export the, your Cubase project into Cubasis, probably for reasons of the complexity of Cubase, but I think in order to try and bring more of the professional side in, I think this back and forward between the both platforms maybe needs to be a bit more fluid. Possibly if you buy um, you know, a full price desktop uh, plugin, that, it, that somehow, I don't know if, if it's technically able to do that, that it, 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 it frees up a, a, an iOS version of that plugin as well, so that you can kind of maintain some sort of parity of but Adobe workflow. also has this problem as well, doesn't it? So it's trying to introduce Rush as an intermediary yes. between Premiere and whatever the most basic thing is. And as far as I'm aware, you can't send a Premiere project into Rush. No. Right. So they're no. trying to do the yeah. ideas capturing uh, idea when you're capture. on the go. Probably you do this a lot when you're building your blogs. Yes. And then if you want to go more pro, you keep going desk and desktop. If you, yeah, if, if, you, if you need to. I love the limitation. But you know, I think it's going to be up to you know, Apple to do Logic Pro you know, on, on an iPad to show people this is how powerful this device is. And this is how it can go in between the Mac and, and an iPad, you know. But what I've learned is sometimes learning specific iOS apps that are both for the iPad and the iPhone, 
allows you now to be able to go back and forth between those. And so that's kind of where it kind of, you know, it can start in that way. And you can be a little bit more mobile, like you were saying. Would you on, stay in Rush, for, uh, Adobe Rush, for example, rather than going to Premiere to keep that um, compatibility, that exchange? I, I, love, I love a program called LumaFusion because they've taken everything that, you know, is able to be done from, you know, somebody who really wants to get a professional looking video shot directly edited on your iPad um, without having to go back to Premiere or go to Final Cut. And I've been using that for the last two years, like without I guess that's else. exciting for new companies. There's an opportunity there. If you can create something that doesn't need to have that. To have the extensions. Maybe yeah. those are the new, the new right. products of the future. Right. Excellent points. And our next question is from two ADC keynote speakers from the past. So you may recognize both these guys. <laughs> hey everybody, Ari Prohaska from AudioKit here. And I'm Roger Lynn, maker of Linstrument, and uh, we have a question for the panel. Um, one thing that I've noticed, and my Linstrument customers have noticed, is that the iPad is becoming a much better and more professional platform for music making. And a lot of people are saying, I'd like to use iPad as my primary tool for music making. Um, and also, I know that it's getting much easier because of uh, things that you make, like audio kit, uh, to make um, audio plugins for or audio uh, um, uh, apps for iOS. Right. So the hardware is getting better, the operating system is getting better, and the tools for building these apps is getting better. Community of users who support each other and help each other make better, more interesting apps. Um, so I see everything about the iPad world getting better and better getting very close to what the Mac has to offer. Yeah, so here's the problem. iOS users, or now iPad OS users, have traditionally been less willing to pay as much for audio software uh, as those on uh, Mac OS. And so the question is, do you see that this increased demand to use iPads as a platform uh, will cause users to be willing to pay more and therefore allow developers to have more resources for developing more professional apps? Or do you think merely that if you build it, they will come? Yes, the app maker. <laughs> I, I, I want to clarify though, so I think like iPad is a wonderful device and I love the direction it's going, but just to be clear, like music making on iPad is a niche market. And from a business standpoint, it's like super hard. Like those companies that we talk about, like very few of them make any money and they're mostly independent and have a hard time getting by sort of. Uh, so I would lean back to iPhone again, because for Orcs, that's where we sort of have over 80% of both users and revenue okay. and where things are happening. Um, so, and I also think it's very hard to sort of in, in transitioning from sort of Mac to iPad to sell the idea that like you want a DAW, but you can get like Ableton or Bitwig of any of these apps quite cheap today and they work really well and they have a huge ecosystem and they have all this like community support. So even if I'm sort of in your camp with regards to like how a great touch experience can be. The, the reason, that, like that transition isn't really happening. Uh, so we just need to sort of remember that. I think. Until it does, because I look at my son and he's nine years old and he's had an iPad since he was one. And in the next 10 years, between the time he's 10 and 18, that'll be his most used device that he wants to do everything on. And so the kids that are becoming the ones who, you know, are, in, 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 you know, very curious about music or art or, you know, development, they're going to want to figure out how to use it on the things that they, you know, that, that are getting better. And to me, I believe that, you know, over time, these apps, these iOS updates, all of these things that are happening will enable the kids of the future to be able to make these communities, make the apps, and make uh, you know, platforms big enough to sustain a whole company, um, given the fact that you know, they're only getting better. So I, I just continuously forecast towards the future, because now, at 40 years old, I can see a different time frame from when I started to when you know, what things will be sustainable over time. I don't know. There are three things, actually, I think, that have impacted that. One is um, software companies and developers have had to rethink how you design software. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most fascinating things I've experienced over the last few years, I'm sure 
uh, Henrik, you've been through the same thing, is you have to turn your design head upside down and you have to start designing as if you're designing for kids. Yeah. But they're adults, which is maybe is one of the, uh, the problems of uh, adults trying to shift their brains into this new thinking, because we're designing for new people and new generations who are right. thinking differently. So I think that's one factor. In terms of the question, in terms of the monetization model, there's no doubt that making apps is a tough industry. I think probably Henrik and I could speak to what's happened on the App Store in terms of generating revenue. It's tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I think Roger was asking in his question is, is it better to make something and charge money or to have something that's free and gains users? I kind of uh, Yeah, I think it was about the ratio. And luckily, I talked to half a dozen developers who have apps on both desktop and iOS. So I have those numbers for you. <laughs> what? The data. Oh, Everything right. you said okay. is okay. fine, but here's the data. <laughs> No, no, these, these are great answers, and they're completely online with the data. So, and everyone has a different experience. Are we now going to see revenue figures from 10 companies? That would be great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're all going to be anonymous, except for audio damage. And he says, uh, <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> there are no fucks given at Let's go. ABC. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, Roger's initial question was, like, what's the pricing model? And so... Chris is doing eight times an 8x pricing model on desktop. So his desktop apps are eight times the price of their iOS equivalent. And with that, they make up 50% of his revenue now. And he's got 16 platforms you support? And iOS? Yeah. And iOS is just one of them, and it makes up 50% of his sales now. OK, standalone and AV3. Uh, and iOS in this in this case it's iPad only almost or no? I'd say seventy five percent only. Are the phones so seventy five percent of users? Is that users or revenue versus iPad? Oh, for, oh, for, no, I, I, I okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, he's not the only developer that said that, so. Uh, so you can see the ratio, it's like a perfect ratio, the sales eight times as much, pricing one eighth, so I think he may have found a magic formula here. Um, the second developer, uh, they shared their first two months of their sales on both desktop and iOS, and this is an indie developer that made a cent, 13,000 on desktop and about 7,000 on iOS for $20,000 total take for two months. Which is, Pretty good for an indie developer making the first app made with juice. And their pricing was 10x on desktop, and their sales were 33%. Although he wanted me to share with you that he felt he wished his desktop pricing was a lot less. And he's getting a lot of pushback from users, especially because his iOS price point is so low. <laughs> There's an empty chair. Uh, <laughs> uh, so how much can an iPad sense make? This is an indie developer doing pretty well. $125,000 this year off one synth, one platform. That was, this is an app that wasn't featured by Apple. So in case you're wondering like what a high end app makes. And if you don't get lucky and don't get featured by Apple, this is kind of the, the highest end you can make. I do know of a synth that made more than this, uh, but they were featured by Apple. And uh, you know, I don't know how much they're making. They could be making more than this too. Um, but you know, a lot of developers they have multiple apps. Like Chris has 16 apps. So if you had 16 times 100,000, that would be quite quite a nice payday. A quick question on that previous slide. Yeah. The proceeds after Apple's cut. After Apple's cut. Yeah. So the 80,000. So 100. That's their actual total. take home. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And then you get to pay taxes. Then you have to pay taxes. Yeah. And so you may be wondering, that's, that's not 30%. And so I was, uh, yeah. there's, there's returns and there's, uh, you got currency exchanges. So you can't count on getting 70% of sales. Quantity discount and things like that. And so I talked to a lot of these developers about how they were increasing their revenue in 2019 because sales are down across the board. 
And so one way is through AUV3, and this is the best case I could find of someone really increasing their sales. Before AUV3, the month before, they were just under 4,000 that month in revenue, and after, the three months after, they calculated they got about $30,000 extra that's from adding crazy. AUV3. Wow. So, I mean, that's nothing, obviously, to big companies like Focusrite or Native Instruments, but if you're just a solo person, you know, that's quite a boon. And so, a lot of people, a lot of iOS developers have asked about selling in the Mac store, like making a Catalyst version or something like that, so I did find a developer who just did that, and these are some pretty big numbers. Doing $500,000 in sales the past three years on one app, one music app, and they started out on the iPad, and then they did a 2x pricing in the Mac store, and they found out their Mac store version sold even more than their iPad version. Wow. And they felt it was just the point of sale, and it just made it easier for people to buy, and having that, that access, it was the same as iOS. And, uh, doing pretty well, but those are just a few examples. And the thing to think about is they're doing actually a different business model than these two guys. This is all just uh, a one purchase, the one people I talked to. And now there's you know, other opportunities. You can do in-app purchases, you can do subscriptions, which I hear a little more lucrative. Is that true or false? I don't know. It depends. It depends on the app. So there's- Depends there's on many factors, I think, really. It's the general answer is yes, I think. That's the, that's, if you look across businesses in the App Store, it's how you build a sustainable and growing business. Uh, but if you have a lot of um, built up sort of momentum in your brand and so on, as I can assume you have already like customers you can reach out to, you can do this like releases and get these transient type revenue streams. But I wouldn't recommend it if you want to eat, like depends on how you view like business. If you want to build a product and sell it and move on and do something else, and that's one thing. But if you want to build like a legacy and iterate on a product that actually grows over time, uh, then uh, you have to think differently. It's probably worked for Oxy because you have uh, customers who love it and you have <laughs> new, new content that keeps coming in. So you're able to keep a life, higher lifetime value. Whereas if it's something like a synthesizer that comes out and doesn't have presets or anything, I think you tend to see these graphs that are just like dead cat bounces. It's like, shh, dunk. <laughs> and then that's it. you don't get any recurring revenue. So I think there's a scary thing. If you put out a synth by itself, expect it to go, yeah, bunk. <laughs> and then if you have something like uh, Auxy's done, where you're able to keep customers coming back, you have something that hopefully... Uh, not unless Henny sure makes a really nice YouTube video featuring your synthesizer. Uh, so yes. go talk to him about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good idea. Yes, yeah, so subscriptions and in-app purchases only work if you have a good app. So. <laughs> if you don't have a good app, just charge a price for it. I think that's the nice thing about subscriptions, that you actually <laughs> align the incentives with the customer or the user. Yeah. That, you know, it's really low risk for them to... And it's so weird because we, like, it's surprising how much people hate subscriptions. There's this, like, yes. latent, just like, I hate you guys! I hate them. <laughs> what I hate what hate if <laughs> I use this app for five years and love it every day? I'm going to pay this much? It's like, but on the flip side, you don't have to pay like 350 or whatever Ableton costs. You can just pay $5 and get started. And if you stop, there's no risk. I think that's good, yeah. yeah. He speaks the truth. <laughs> Check the comment yeah. sections of this video in two weeks when it's posted. There'll just be people like, subscription? Fuck those guys on the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never buying their apps again. <laughs> what? The app is... All right, so uh, we have a, another um, music tech celebrity who wants to talk to you. Hey, everybody. This is Jordan Rudis, keyboardist of the Van Dream Theater and president of Wisdom Music makers of apps like GeoShred and MorphWiz and HarmonyWiz. Pleasure to be here speaking virtually with the panel for mobile versus desktop software. I've had a wonderful time over the years exploring lots of different kinds of software. I'm very interested in the mobile software and all the touch interfaces that are possible. I was inspired when the iPhone first came out to create something called MorphWiz, which uh, allowed you to morph between simple waveforms and visuals and uh, it was a big success the concept it was a um, it was a test for me to see if what i had in my mind would work but that has really um gone on in a beautiful way i've seen hardware come out now that that uh, is catching up with the creativity of the software 
uh, things like the Seaboard and of course the uh, amazing Linstrument. What I'm excited about still with the mobile space is it still maintains that spirit of creativity. You've got all kinds of amazing things um, that people are doing. I was playing with an application earlier today that does uh, geometric shapes and you're able to transform the geometric shapes in all different kinds of ways in three dimensions and it directly affects uh, what's going on with your musical patterns, things like that. Things uh, like a morphing, audio morphing project I'm doing that's very much dependent on uh, you know your fingers independently on the screen. So I'll ask you guys, where do you think that that is going? You know, uh, it's exciting where we're at, but where is the whole thing going? Where are the tablets going? What is coming up next? Okay, see you on the road. What's next? Big question. I, I, yeah, go, do you want to well, say? After you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's next? Uh, there's a lot of things that's next, but what, uh, kind of what sort of strikes me is that when he, the, the apps he shows and so on, they're all like interesting conceptually, but what I care about uh, is, is sort of coming from the music angle and how that sort of is in culture and what happens in music. Because, you know, I've been in, in this like music tech scene and a geek for my whole life, basically, and I love that, but, but I also love music. and. To me, there's like two different worlds because we tend to get really like stuck on all these esoteric features and synths and advanced technology and so on. But meanwhile, there's another world out there that creates music that, you know, shifts, changes the world and where that millions of people listen to. And, and what I care about is trying to be there and do something that impacts that. And in our case, that happens to be about like, giving sort of a really powerful creator, creator tool and essentially a studio in your pocket to like the next generation growing up who are just going to have a completely different mindset about things and do things differently and hopefully create music that sort of changes things and that will be remembered. Uh, so, so in my world, it's just like there are so many interesting conceptual things in music tech, but they have very little impact on the overall sort of music that people listen to. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so like something that's been a big problem with iOS devices is uh, the hardware that you need to use it on stage. And I think this has been something that has uh, kind of held certainly the iPad back from being used on stage as much as perhaps it should be. I mean, it, I think things have, have improved in recent years. Uh, There's something I've got to say first though, Removing the headphone jack was a shit move. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, because the sound quality from a headphone jack was actually not bad. I mean, it's not as good as a dedicated audio interface, but the removal of it and not get, being given anything in its place, you know, uh, this leads to what I certainly think would be the biggest game changer is low latency wireless audio. Yes. That's what we need. That is the thing, I think, because then, you know, having, like, say, an iPad on a mount without having anything or no bloody clagnut dangling off the arse of it and just being able to, to use it in its, in its shape, you know, in, 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 and not, you know, be tethered. And, and have that wireless mm -hmm. audio into, you know, that's, uh, I think that would just make, it would just make the iPad just sort of such a brilliant live instrument. I know it's probably really difficult to do and in a gig, you've got to be really careful. I've fallen foul of this as well. You know, Bluetooth, this, an audience, all with their Bluetooth enabled devices, there's a lot of congestion there in, in the wireless world and you know, things which work perfectly in the rehearsal room, just uh, kind of balk on stage. So I would love to see that. I'd love to see that wireless audio becoming really robust. Uh, and I think that would then just Good increase answer. everything. Any, what's next? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah, it, it, I think, you know, over time of, of being around for a couple of decades in music professional, like as a record producer professionally for some time, it's always been how convenient 
how much more convenient can a device or a product or software be? So, like I said, you know, some of these cool ways that you can tinker and do things are awesome. Um, but, you know, in reality, when you're in a studio and you're with these artists and they just want you to play some shit that's going to blow their minds, you want it to be quick, you want it to be seamless, you want it to just work. And you want to be able to get to a space where you can collaborate and do other things with artists, songwriters, musicians, and the like. And so I love the idea that the iOS just makes things more convenient. Now, how much more convenient? Bluetooth audio would be great. Uh, low latency Bluetooth audio uh, would be great, or a whole other way to do low latency wireless audio something. Um, Dictation. Uh, I, I really think dictation over the next five to ten years is going to be huge uh, in in all software and how it relates to you being able to not have to use your hands at all. And it's just being able to be able to call up on things that you know you can do versus the history and the knowledge that you have on, you know, uh, music theory, the whole nine. So if I'm able to call up samples from, you know, this and loop it into this tempo and this, and you have, you know, the type of data that can be able to pull that and bring that into a session or being able, like, these things I think are, are you know, the future in my head, so. Matt? I really like hearing about convenience, I think. Certainly, convenience is one of the main things that people want in the future. And I also really love hearing you both speak about you just want these things. Like, just give us those <laughs> yeah. things. Yeah. And if you could just have those things. I don't care. All the problems are solved. But it's true, right? Because with that, until those things happen, it's not convenient. Right. Um, and so I think my sort of, my sort of hunches of the future, um, well, certainly we have to wait and see when the Intel chip dies and the ARM chip replaces it in a, in a MacBook. And then really, what is the difference between an iPad right. and a Mac? Point. Uh, you've got the web becoming very blurred and intertwined with iOS. So what point do we no longer even use these words because we don't care because they're all so synonymous with each other. It just works as one and we don't really mind. In terms of predictions for the future, my prediction is more of a hope that Apple actually gets the App Store back on track and helps indie developers like anyone in this room because at the moment it's in a dire state. Uh, since they changed the App Store, uh, Games are at the front. You have to bury eight levels deep to get to a music app. Search ads have come in. So if you've got loads of money, you can absolutely beat anyone hands down. Those charts you saw earlier, there's probably not much advertising going on in those, is my guess. Right, right. But you know what? Uh, going back to the question of uh, copy protection earlier, there is none on the App Store. Your app can be copied within two months. If a serious app developer wants to, it can come in with 60 developers, completely copy your app put as much advertising back into it and coerce customers into buying the subscription so that they feed that money back into an advertising cycle to fuel the Don't success. tell everyone this. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give up the game. Give well, up the game. Just, Might as well. Just check your, check your ethics to the side and <laughs> off you go and good luck to you. Uh, I don't think that's why we're in this room because that's not really our goal. Our goal is to make really cool things and help uh, but, but, but as far as I've seen, like, no, none of these like, scam apps, as I would call them, has done any interesting thing. There's no one making any music that anyone cares about in these apps. So they, they are they definitely upsetting the app store. Like they, they, they I, crowd the marketplace. But exactly, and I uh, think they stop great apps from being seen. Yeah. So if someone gets coerced into a bad experience, what's going to make them come back and make but, more music? But luckily, we have people like you and other people yes. on yeah. YouTube, because what I Very think is, point. and that's also the, the, the reason it takes so long for things to change, is that today, when they want to learn something, they go on YouTube and they search for it, yeah. and they're going to find some person who is 99% of the time going to be in Ableton or Apple Studio and sit there and explain how they make music and they're going to aspire to do the same thing. So that's great to have new I love stories what you said, and role models. You're yeah. absolutely right. People like yourself are, are more important than ever. Wow. And never Gosh. sell out to a scammy app. All right. All right. No pressure. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Those are all really great answers. And our final question is uh, someone you've probably seen at Ableton Loop, a great sound designer, editor at large for Electronic Musician Magazine. We've got Francis here with a question. That's about some technology that's going to really impact the entire market. Hey, everybody. This is Francis Prev coming at you on a gorgeous fall day for the State Park in Texas. Smart. I've been thinking a Can lot Can we get some more volume? Or, like, let's say I'm a developer. Is the AV team here still? You get the screen? Hello? 
<laughs> hey. I'm my camper. All right, Francis, once again. Hey, everybody, this is Francis Prev coming at you on a gorgeous fall day at Fort Parker State Park in Texas. And I've been thinking a lot about Catalyst. Let's say I'm a developer and I make a synth that's available in Win, Mac OS, and iOS versions, and the synth is identical on all three platforms. But the Win and Mac OS versions are in the $100 to $200 range, and the iOS version is in the $20 to $30 range. It seems quite possible that Catalyst is going to enable iOS AV3 plugins to run on the Mac desktop, which means that the Mac and iOS version could be $20 to $30, while the Windows version remains in its $100 to $200 price range. If this happens, how is the industry going to adapt? It seems quite likely. And in addition, how are those iOS AV3 apps going to compete on the Mac desktop when there are hundreds of apps that start at $5? It seems like it's something to think about because if Apple does in fact make Catalyst um, a platform for AUV3, everybody's going to have to adapt. And I'm curious as to what everybody's thinking about this particular scenario. Cheers. OK, so in case you guys don't know, there's this new technology, Catalyst, which will allow iOS apps and plugins to run on Catalina and above. And it's supposed to be as easy as a checkbox, but it's not quite there. And kind of the plan is there's 400 AUV3s now on iOS, and Apple would like to see all of them available in the Mac store mm -hmm. at a low price point under $20. And there may even be some easy ways to buy that within other apps on the desktop without saying more. And so like, how is that going to affect the industry when the industry is flooded with all these point of sales and very inexpensive AUV3s? And uh, any of you guys have any thoughts on that? Or maybe something you guys w might want to think about as well. Yeah. There's one thing we do know, and the high priced apps in the app store became less fewer and fewer over time. It's starting to be replaced by new business models of subscription, freemium, in-app purchase. Um, it would seem to lead towards that as a conclusion in my own interpretation of this. It's a complete guess, <laughs> but uh, if we use that as a blueprint, it points to the future. And so maybe there's change coming. Excellent. Yeah, um, you know, I, I just want to put that out there and, you know, Francis wanted to, you know, make you guys aware and just to think about among yourselves. I don't think anyone knows the answer. And since we're done with these, uh, so f like remote questions, I'll just let the panelists, you know, say where they think the future of desktop and mobile is going. If you want to have some final thoughts and we'll start with Gaz here. Okay, so I mean, I, the latest iPad Pro that I've got, I've very rarely used it as a musical instrument anymore. Like my previous iPads, I used as musical instruments much more. Um, I tend to use iPads as uh, in the studio as control surfaces for, for instance, there's a, you know, a really good Cubase controller. I use Studio One, it's another great controller. And uh, and also, I'm acquiring quite a few older devices that are, um, you know, that are kind of obsolete uh, older iOS devices. They're still useful as, uh, again, multiple controllers. So, like in my studio, I've got four iPads, uh, which, so when I set up a session, I can have four iPads controlling different aspects of the. Uh, the music software. I mean, I mostly do this just up. All right, you know. guys. I, I just got the news that they need the room since we I got started got started late. But we're all here at the conference. You can ask any one of us any questions. And we're so excited you came. And thank you so much. Give yourselves a round of applause. Mic drop. Thank you.